morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is that you're listening to this. Welcome along to the latest instalment of Turfcast podcast, and we've got a very special guest today. Um, not you, so we have got Simon, but I'm not. I'm not oh. on about Simon. Uh, but yeah, there how are you doing, mate? You all right? I'm all right, thanks, mate. Another week, right, another week, another week in lockdown. I ain't been out much this week as well. No, do you know what? I'm getting. I must admit, I'm getting a bit lazier in my routine. Yeah, so I've not. I've but, not been out. I went out for a run on Sunday, but that's not this week, is it? That's why I haven't been out of the house since Sunday. I've been in the front garden because I had visitors. Obviously, they stay on the other side of the wall. So that's that's about as far as I've got. Oh, uh, so tell us about your special guest then. Go on, and how did you interview him? If you have got your social distancing, I hope he was over the other side of the wall. Obviously, it was on the other side of this. It's like this, mate, unfortunately. Uh, so, yeah, we've got um, Matthew Lawton coming up um, on the Turfcast podcast. You'll notice that this is another of our In Conversations with. We did one earlier in the year with um, Ian Wright, obviously played for Burnley, ended his career at Burnley. And now we've got our first current footballer and current Burnley player. Um, but obviously, you know all about it, mate. So it's a big shout-out to you because um, you helped me set it up. No, you're welcome, mate. It's something that we've been probably... Not seriously discussing, but having sort of thoughts about over the years. But obviously, what better time than now to try new things and, and maybe branch out. And do you know what? It, it, you can thank me, but it's sort of like I just asked him and he was more than willing. I sent you the messages. He was keen to help, to be honest with you, and keen to sort of like speak. I, I didn't think he would be because I've never asked before. So I've always had this inner fear of asking them. But uh, no, he seemed, he seemed buzzing. He was keen to sort of get out there and do it. Yeah, it was a really good interview, though. I really enjoyed it. Um, like I said, it is a bit of a shame that I couldn't go and meet him and stuff, because I do feel interviews are a lot better face-to-face. You can get people to relax more and stuff like that. And they were a bit cheeky at, 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 off-camera, actually. I did say to him, it's a shame I can't meet you, mate, because I'd, I'd, I'd have scrounged a shirt off you. So I guess that's the perfect time to introduce it, then. Here is my chat I had earlier this week with Burnley fullback Matthew Lawton. <laughs> Right, so first of all, Matt, thank you very much for joining us on Turfcast Podcast. Honestly, it means a lot, mate. It really, really does. No problem at all. Uh, that air's looking pretty wild as well, mate. And I can't really yeah. say much, to be fair. Mine is as well, but I guess we're all the same boat, aren't we? Yeah, well, I usually have it cut every, every what, week, 10 days, something like that. So, um, yeah, it's had a good six weeks of growth now. It's, it's horrendous. Yeah, I've just tried to make mine look a bit messy, and it's not really working. Yeah. Looks all yeah. right. <laughs> well, that's it. I just use some like some products and stuff. But yeah, Simon obviously rings me every time he goes to yours and stuff. So I'm fully aware of how often you get it cut. It's quite often, isn't it? I'm, I'm opposite me. I'm like once a month when I can be bothered. But now it's been like two, three months, and it's getting pretty, pretty bad. Pretty, yeah. pretty bad. It comes around quite often. Yeah, um, I like to keep it fresh. Um, but I usually have a skin phase, so it's 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 quite noticeable when I'm not at it cut. But yeah. Six- Six weeks, it's I mean, I probably can't even tell, but the, the sides and the back are horrendous. Yeah, pretty sure I can guess because mine's the same. But um, first of all, I just want to end the debate about your last name because there's a bit of a like some people say Lawton, some people say Lawton. Which one is it? It's actually, it's actually Lawton. Lawton, right, cool. Yeah. I think most people always say, like, I think commentators tend to say like Lawton quite a lot. Yeah. I get that all the time, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's weird because it's not a name that you'd expect people would have trouble with. No, no, I've never had it to be honest until um, still started playing football as I got a bit older. And you might say commentators, uh, people like that, um, pronouncing it how, how they do. So, um, you know, my granddad's my granddad's not very happy. He's always telling me to tell the commentators how to pr- to pronounce it properly. <laughs> I can imagine. I I get, I, same with me because man's man's just a normal last name, it's Redmond. So, but you sometimes get Redmond, Redmond, Redfern. Yeah. That, it, it's it's weird, and it people just like to 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 make things. Like some people so called Jeff Hendrick, Jeff Hendricks. It's like yeah. where are you getting that S from? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. It is odd, but I've just, I've just grown to you know get on with it now. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. So I was locked down treating you. Then obviously I can I can hear some of the kids. I presume that is in the background. Yeah, Harry's just came in now. It's carnage. Um, it's carnage. They're, yeah, it's... they're doing uh, they're doing the score work when they can. I yeah, I can imagine. Every day, so we've, we've, they've got a signing on their iPads, things like that. So they're, they're keeping up with the schoolwork, and then they're just pestering. Yeah, so, and, well, my man's only two, but obviously, I've obviously you've got older ones as well. I know you've got a, are you a about eighteen months, your youngest at the minute. Yes, she is. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can imagine if it, so. It's four kids you've got now, isn't it? I can imagine it's bedlam. Obviously, like you say, Harry's just come in there. Yeah, it is. It is carnage. Yeah. Um, but yeah. you know, it's, it's nice to spend a bit of time with them. Obviously, with with football, and I'm away every other weekend on away game stuff like that. So. 
I've uh, been spending a lot of time with them. And, uh, it's just unfortunate we can't actually go anywhere, you know, the park or, or play areas, things like that. But we're doing the best we can. We have the, we have the painting out. You know, when the weather's nice, we're out in the garden and things like that. So it's just trying to keep them occupied. The the, the older three get it, to be honest, because the score made yeah. it quite what, what was happening. But obviously the youngest has got no idea. I think she's wondering probably why she's not left the house for so long to go <laughs> anywhere. Oh. Yeah, I think I think mine's the same as well because he's only two, um, and, and he can't really communicate that well yet and understand what we're doing. And he, and he did go to nursery, but I guess at the minute he's just like, why am I not at nursery all the time? But I don't know about you, but I'm absolutely sick to death of Peppa Pig. Yeah, oh yeah, Peppa oh. Pig and Baby Shark. She's got an obsession with Baby Shark. Yeah, so, Parker yeah. had that when he was younger. But I don't yeah. know if you've ever ever watched something called Blippi. No, it's this American like TV entertainer. Do not introduce your youngest to that, whatever you do. We introduce no. Parker to it, and my God, all he ever does is point at the TV. He's like, blippy, blippy. It's like, no, yeah. and it's 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 not even watchable, whereas Peppa Pig is barely watchable. This blippy isn't watchable. It's it's a really, really pain in the arse, to be honest. Can avoid that, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, but I know you enjoy your PlayStation, don't you? I presume you've, when you've got chance, been doing a lot of gaming. Yeah, um, I play Fortnite quite a lot um, when I can. Obviously, at the minute, it's... To carnage me and the the wife trying to help out each other, you know, trying to keep each other sane, um, cooking and and tidying yeah. up like that, trying to do my bit. And, but you know, when the kids are in bed, um, she's quite nice to me. She watches Hollyoaks and stuff that she's catching up on, so I just disappear into the other room and play on there. Yeah. yeah have you not tried the new Call of Duty that was on once? That's a battle royale style game, isn't it? It is. Yeah, a lot of lads have told me to try it, but I've not I've not been on there yet. Um, I might have to try it uh, soon because a lot of people are saying it's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one that we play on quite a lot. I, I love it. I, I, it's class. Absolutely love it. Me and Simon on it every night. As soon, yeah. like, again, we're fighting with Mrs. trying to get all control at TV and stuff. But um, if we both get on, we both play that. Uh, you're not really into your into your FIFA then? No, I've not played FIFA for a long, long time. Um, I only ever used to play Pro Evo. Well, that was a that was years ago. Yeah. Um, I've not played football on the on the PlayStation for a long time now. Did you not watch Dwight in the EPL Invitational? I've seen some clips of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, him and Chaz are always going about it at football, so um, I knew if someone was going to be involved, that, uh, that Dwight would be. Yeah, well, the new one starts today, doesn't it? I think it starts yeah, around I, 10 minutes, yeah. yeah. Charlie's Charlie obviously in it, isn't he? Yeah. So, Just is Charlie any good? or? I've never seen him play, to be honest. They're just always on about the um, the FIFA, what is it, the foot draft team or something like that. I don't know, the internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. something like that. They're always, yeah. it's always talking about that. They've got the app on the phone. And it's, uh, yeah. Just talking about yeah. buying players and stuff. Yeah, I think that's how you do it. And I'm the same. I don't really play FIFA so much anymore. Um, but also in lockdown, you've been doing uh, some charity stuff as well, haven't you? You, you? you and your wife made a, a nice donation to, is it Limestone House? We did, yeah. Limestone House is Abby's, my wife, um, her grandma runs that. It's a charity shop back where uh, Abby grew up. Uh, we made a donation to the to the food bank, yeah, which is um, obviously for people that are struggling to uh, you know get to the shop or afford to, to buy food if they're not working. So, um just trying to do a little bit to help out, yeah, in the uh, in the local community. Yeah, um, before lockdown as well, I think you were struggling with injury, weren't you? Was it your knee? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How, how is the knee? I know you've been for a run today, so I presume by that sense it's getting a bit better. Yeah, we've been. I've been running the last couple of weeks now. The, the um, sessions that they've been sending us, so my knees, my knees, absolutely fine. Yeah, been getting through them perfectly, and it was it was tough. And from a selfish point of view, I think this lockdown sort of came at the right time for me. Yeah, you know, it's given a lot of time for my knee to recover. It was touch and go on surgery, and the doctor said, um, like I said, touch and go. Hopefully, we get through the next three or four weeks. It improves a lot with the injections that I had, and uh, I think it has. So hopefully, I've avoided the uh, the surgery, which would have been more like six months. Yeah. Yeah, and I know it's a bit different playing football and going for a run, but obviously mm. at the minute it, it does seem okay. Are, are you expecting when when lockdown ends and and you can get back to training that you'll be able to play football again and get back on the grass? I think so, yeah. Uh, like I said, the sessions that they're sending through, um, the, the tough sessions, the, uh, there's a lot of turning and, and jumping in, and involved in them. Um, it is pretty much to, to make sure that everyone's ready to go as soon as you go back in. So obviously I'll have to have a fitness test with the physios and, and things yeah. like that. You know, I'm hoping within a couple of days that I'll be back on the on the grass with the boys, yeah. Yeah, hopefully. Um, I just want to, before we crack on to chat about your career and stuff, I just want to get your opinion on like the restart of football. There's a lot of rumours flying about at the minute, neutral venues, I think someone even said today that you know that they might even get uh, sort of like lessen the, the games that like short shorter the game short on the halves. Like obviously, it's, yeah, it does seem a bit of a ridiculous suggestion, doesn't it? But what, what was from a player's perspective? What is it you want to do? I know, I know, I know you'll you'll just want to get out playing, but obviously there's, there's different sort of aspects to it, isn't it? So, so what what is it that you you'd want to happen? 
Yeah, um, well, we we want to finish the season, obviously, but the the main thing is is everyone's safety, yeah. uh, especially with a young family here uh, at home as well. If if I was to go back and for any reason pick it up from from wherever um, and then bring it back to the family, you know, we'd be devastated as as, as humans, not just as players, to do that yeah. to our family. So. We want to play football, but we need to make sure that the, the right uh, things are in place to, to avoid that happening. I know they're talking about a lot of testing, and like I said, the neutral venues, keeping the fans away and things like that. So I think as long as these things are in, in place to, to safeguard the players and the, and the managers and people like that, uh, um, you know, there's no reason why we can't get back and you know, try and entertain the, the public that are stuck at home. Yeah, it's, I mean, it is a shame that, that fans won't be allowed on because it is looking more and more like that will be the case. But it's if, like you say, the season has to be finished. So if that's the only option, that's the only option, I guess. I think so. Yeah, nobody wants that. Like you say, us as players and obviously the fans and live for the live for the game. Um, so it would be, you know, be disappointed that there won't be anyone be able to go and watch. But like we said, the safety is uh, is paramount, really. Um, the amount of people that are there on on match day um, is you know it's huge volumes of numbers. Yeah. You know the massive, the big, big grounds. You're not just the, the fans that are there. You've got your stewards and the police and the, the catering staff, people like that. That you know, easily, you could easily, you know, spike again. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So moving on to your career, then you started out at Leeds. I think you went there when you were like nine or ten. Is that right? Yeah, I got scouted yeah. when I was seven for Leeds, but um, I lived too far away from Leeds at the time, so I wasn't allowed to travel. So I had to wait till I was eight, and then uh, we went up. We went up to Leeds and had a trial, and yeah, I got signed there. So what was it like getting scouted at, at such a young age? What are your memories of it? Because I presume you were like playing Sunday League football or whatever in, yeah, in Chesterfield or, and, and yeah, your scouts coming it. along sort of thing. Yeah, I, I remember my dad pulled me over to the side. Ah. <laughs> and he said, he said uh, through the game, um, someone, someone special has come to see you. And I thought at the time it was my uncle who lived in Plymouth. Yeah. So um, just tried that a little bit harder sort of thing and I managed to score five goals. I think it was on the day. Um, and then they came over to mum and dad at the end and said um, that they want they want to offer me a, a trial basically. So you know I was buzzing. I loved football since since I can remember. My dad ran the football team with my brother who was a couple of years older. Yeah. So you know delighted to to get a, a trial and then it went from there really. What was it like being in the academy slash youth setup at Leeds then? It was very good. Um, the setup there was you know it was fantastic. Um, the the team at the time was, was really good as well, <laughs> you know, in the Champions League semi final, and yeah. they were, you know, really good in the, in the Premier League, obviously. So it was, you know, seeing players like that um, when we trained on Saturday mornings and things like that up at, up at the uh, Thorpe Arch was, you know, it was, it was everything that, you know, a young footballer wants. The setup was brilliant. There was the pitches were pristine. Everything was just really good. Yeah. Do you ever get to speak to a lot of the first teamers when you when you saw young and, and do they come and talk to you and stuff like that and watch you? They did, yeah, they were very good. Um, we didn't see them very often because we obviously we train at night um, when you're in the right. academy. Um, when we were playing, when we were training Saturday mornings, you know, maybe the first team um, didn't play while the Sunday or something like that. So they were there training as well, and you know they were always very polite and um, came over and spoke to us. Yeah, it was good. You moved to Sheffield United Academy in 2004. Um, what happened there then? Did it not work out at Leeds? Did you fancy a change of scenery sort no, of thing? Leeds just said they weren't renewing my contract. Yeah, they said uh, I was too small at the time. Was I wasn't big enough to get around the pitch? Hmm. Um, is what they said. So you know, I was devastated. Um, but it was pretty much um, a reality check sort of thing. Um, do I give up? Do I stop now? Or, or you know, do I do I kick on and sat down with mum and dad? And we'd learned a lot over the years at the Leeds Academy because the coaches were, were top top end. So you know, we agreed that um, obviously all I ever wanted to do was football, so there was there was no chance of me giving up. We wrote to probably six or seven different teams asking for trials, um, and then I got a few letters back. I went on trial at Mansfield, um, a trial at Chesterfield, things like that, and then Sheffield United offered me a trial. Um, my uncle and a lot of my family members were, were big Sheffield United fans as well, so you know, it was a team that was quite close to my heart because my uncle used to take me a lot. Um, if I wasn't watching Chesterfield, so you know, I went there, um, got for me a six-week trial, and then signed me after three weeks. So um, it was happy. It was back into a academy football, and you know, head down and work hard. Yeah, a lot of footballers tend to have that story, don't they, where they've got rejected at a young age and then carry on. Do you think a lot of people sometimes, like you, for example, do you think you needed that reality check at that age? Or I think uh, I think so. Yeah, I mean, a lot of a lot of players, like you say, have this, have a similar sort of thing uh, happen to them. Um, and I think as you were a bit younger. You don't really realise kind of what's 
what's happening. So you kind of just get on with it sort of thing. The years pass by and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, he gets 14, 15, and then it starts becoming, um, you know, you, you've got to get a scholarship at 16. So it starts becoming a bit a bit real. Yeah. And then when you when you get that knock, it's sort of, oh, this is this is real. So, you know, you know I can't just glide through this. So um, I think it gave me a bit of a kick up the backside, yeah. And, you know, probably it was a good thing that, that happened to me. Obviously, Sheffield United's a big, big club. 20 minutes from my house so um, you know I could get there a lot easier and you know I enjoyed it uh, as soon as I signed there the coaches were brilliant Kevin Fogg was there Scott Sellers Ron Reed, people like that would you know brought, us, brought me through and taught me a lot of stuff young that, that I still use today Yeah before making a full, uh, a full team appearance though at Sheffield United you had a few loan spells didn't you I think the first one was at Sheffield Sheffield FC Sheffield FC what, yeah um, Yeah what was that like? Um, that was that was probably one of the best things that's ever happened to me as well Um it was, you know, it's men's men's football. And five, six hundred people there every week watching. And you know, as yourself as a fan, how much that means to yeah. that football club means to you. So you know, it was it wasn't gone from playing reserve football where obviously the results kind of important, but it's not if you know what I mean. So then, mm-hmm. but then you go there and you know you're playing for people's <laughs> enjoyment and you know trying to make them happy at the weekend uh, that they've worked for all week. So you know, it, suddenly it meant something trying to yeah. Uh, yeah. trying to play. And like I say, it was it was gone from reserves again to men's football, which is which is totally different, um, you know, different kettle of fish. Someone trying to stop you playing, and you know the the, the, uh, the physicality of it and, and things like that. It made me grow up. Um, and you know, we lost in the playoff final, but um, I had a I had a great four or five months there, and, and uh, still to this day, like I say, I think it's one of the best things that ever happened to me. I bet you're on the uh, receiving end of a few challenges. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Like, yeah, I was. I remember one game. In particular, where the, the, the um, uh, I can't remember the team actually, but we, we I could picture it now. I've gone to clear one down the line, and someone's you know fully cleared me out, and um, yeah. our centre halves marched over to him and, and headbutted him. <laughs> he actually headbutted him, put him on the floor, and you know he was he was always there looking out for me, sort of thing. And it was yeah, I got a few tasty tackles and a few you know a few rooks things like that because like I say, it's men's football and it means something. So um, aside obviously from the fighting, which is which was not good, but you, you you sort of you sort of realise. What's at stake? Yeah, do you think like players, especially younger players, need that? Not necessarily to go and get wiped out and have the centre half uh, start a fight for them, but do you think they need to, to sort of like, have a reality check down in the lower leagues? I definitely think so. Yeah, um, you know, reserve team football, well, the under twenty threes as it is now, is, is great for you know for um, getting the development and things like that. But you know, there's nothing that can compare to, to first team football, men's football. Uh, like I say, it makes you grow up, makes you realise how much it means to people. And what you need to be um, on it and focused and things like that, and yeah, I think every every young lad will benefit from going to play. Um, so a couple of young lads came up to me before in the season and asked, "Is it worth going on loan to you know different teams and stuff like this?" And I said, "Yeah, hundred percent." It's you know if you if you're not playing in the first team here and you know you're not on the edges of it, you might as well go out and play. What well, if you go on loan for six months, get 20, 25 games under your belt, mm-hmm. uh, and you'll learn no end in them twenty five games from what you know you'd learn. From you know playing reserves football, you're not gonna you're not gonna get that. Uh, and you also went out on loan to a Hungarian club whose yeah. name I'm not even going to try and pronounce. Aaron I've Faros. written it down. So what <laughs> what, what is it? Sorry, Baron Schwaros. There you go. That's perfect pronunciation. <laughs> but it must be strange moving to to Budapest. I think it is, isn't it? At, at such a young age. I think you were 19, something like that at the time. Yeah. It was yeah. What was that like? Um, it was tough to start off with. I'm a very homely boy, so I got homesick for. You know, the first uh, three or four weeks, uh, found it tough. Wanted to come home, but um, once the game started, um, it, it was a lot more enjoyable. The chairman at the time owned Ferenc Farris as well as Sheffield United, so he, he oh, okay, um, yeah. that's why it came about. And the coaches were saying that we do want to send us on loan and get us some more experience. Um, and that was that was an option for the three of us that went out there. Um, and like I say, after they got over the homesick. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, the next step, really, was um, it was tough. There were good good sides out there. Um, it is a good a good level, um, but again, there was, there was like ten, fifteen thousand there watching. Very, very passionate fans. Mm. Very passionate. You know the the the, the hooligans and, and things like that. Um, you know, we were told that if we lose, not to go out at night because um, you know you get you get in trouble, sort of thing. They were very, very passionate, and again, made me grow up even more living on my own. Uh, having to, you know, fend for myself, cook, clean, um, you know, get myself up in in the morning, and things like that, look after myself right, um, making sure that I was ready for training and games and stuff, and you know, it's all these things, all these little things have, you know, um, helped me over the years. 
That must have been quite scary, though, being told that if you lose, do not leave your house. It was a little bit. And I mean, I don't know uh, how serious it was, but um, I think, you know, the lads that have been over there a long time, a couple of them spoke English um, and they were saying how passionate the fans are and how, you know, how serious it can be if you're seen on a night out after you've lost sort of thing. Like, they don't want you to think that you're not bothered. So they were saying, you know, try and keep your head down if, if, if things are going against us sort of thing. But, you know, again, like I say, um, that's, that's the fans and obviously a bit more a bit more over the top maybe than around uh, here. But, you know, that's just, that's just how, that's, um, how it is. That's their team and, you know, they want to win. Let's talk about The Athletic, which is a must for all football fans and has loads of brilliant Burnley content. The Athletic brings you the best coverage of football, combat sports, NFL, NBA and loads more. A world-class team of football writers, including Andy Jones, who covers the Clarets, and it's completely ad-free with no ads and no annoying pop-ups. If you're not signed up to The Athletic yet, fans of Turfcast can now get 50% off the annual subscription price and a seven-day free trial. To get the deal, head to theathletic.co.uk forward slash turfcast yeah moving on to Sheffield United then you slowly started breaking into the first team and made a few starts a few substitute appearances then you finally I think you got your a start on the opening day of the season the next season after that but then you got sent off at the, on the opening day I've, I've just read so what happened there talk me through that um, yeah um, I played um, towards the end of the season the previous season like you say um, Kevin Blackwell gave my debut Gary Speed was you know instrumental in that he he pushed hard for it and he worked hard with me on, on and off the pitch individually to, to help me grow. And um, like I say, he came to the name of the team on the on the Friday of, of the Cardiff game away. Um, you know, and he's, 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 put, he's put me in, Kevin Blackwell's put me in the team. Um, I remember the I still remember the feeling now, you know, I was like, I just wanted to just pretty much jump up in the air and, you know, obviously you're not going to do that. So I was just, I was just chilling and I went back, told the missus, the mum and dad and, you know, everyone was everyone arranged, I don't know how many tickets, for the lads yeah. to come down and my mum and dad, granddad and all that. And then, like you say, 30, 32, 33 minutes in, um, a ball's broke between me and, and someone else. And I've, I've, I've just flown in wholeheartedly sort of thing. And, you know, I've took a lot. Um, I think I think it was a time where the, the tackles were sort of trying to get, the refs were sort of trying to get these sort of tackles out of the game, if you know what I mean. And obviously, um, he sent me off here yeah, and I was, I was pretty much <laughs> devastated. We were one look at the time. I think we drew one all in the end. So it wasn't too bad, but... Mixture of feelings on that day, yeah. Yeah, so what did the family say to you then afterwards when you met them all afterwards and all your friends and stuff like that? Yeah, well, my mum and dad were just uh, gutted, really. I could see it in their faces. You know, they didn't want they didn't want me to be upset sort of thing. And my brother, uh, he was he's the same. He gets He's still nervous every day these days, so I can't imagine how he felt that day. Um, and a couple of the lads just, I think, had a bit of a laugh trying to make, trying to, you know, trying to lighten the situation sort of thing, but... I think it's one of those things. Another one, I suppose, that's, that helped me along the way um, on, a, on another learning curve. And then the three weeks after that I was suspended, I remember the manager saying um, to the fitness coach to, to run me to run me hard, you know, sort of thing, yeah. to make yeah. sure that um, I'm ready to go again and, and to realise that, you know, I'm still a young lad in this in this pecking order sort of thing. And um, But it was, a, it, was, it was a tough day, but, you know, I got through it. Did it make you push on even more after that? Because you'd got your chance and then there was a little bit of a setback with the red card. Yeah, he does. Yeah, like I said, he, the, the fitness coach was with me, um, and he was he was working me hard and saying that you need to come back strong. You know, this is another do I do I you know not give up sort of thing, but do I you know do you get do you sulk sort of thing? Has it gone? Have I, my chance gone? Or or do you get your head down? Do you work hard? And then as soon as another chance comes, um, try and be ready for it. Um, that's, that's what I did. Just just got my head down and worked hard. Yeah. So your first senior goal though came against yeah. Burnley, I believe. It did. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know that. You know, I, I'm re- reading up on researching today, and I saw that it came against Burnley. I think, I think we were two nil up, weren't we, at Bramall Lane in a three-three draw? You pulled it back to two-two. Then Jay yeah. Rodriguez was obviously back at the club now, made it three-two to the Clarets, and then obviously pulled it back and end up three-three. But obviously, yeah. we're against Burnley. But I bet you were buzzing, weren't you, to, to finally get your first goal? I was. I was. Abs- I was buzzing. Yeah, I played centre mid that day. Uh, Gary Speed was the manager. Um, he told me to, to. Well, he put he brought me on. Sorry, and then he put me in centre mid, and he said. You know, make make the box. I've seen you in training, um, finishing sort of thing, and, and you know, make the box and stuff like that. And I remember, weirdly, still remember this. Um, in the week, we'd been working on cutbacks uh, in training. You know, covering different areas and things like that in in the box. And I seen that they'd gone deep. The player, I can't remember it was, it was gone really deep to the byline. So I thought the only ball on really was to pull it back, and uh, it fell to me. And I just tried to get some on it. 
I think it went straight through. I think it was Jensen him in there. And yeah. I just, yeah, just ran off celebrating. <laughs> Didn't really know what to do because I'd never really, never really done it. So uh, I was just, I was just buzzing. Yeah. Quite prolific at Sheffield United as well, weren't you? You scored ten goals there. Yeah. Um, we, like I said, well, um, the manager at the time, Gary Speedy, he's played me centre mid um, because I don't know. In training, I used to pop up with a few goals and things like that. So he used to tell me to get on the end of things and. Used to send me up for corners and stuff like that, and I used to uh, got a few goals there, like you say. And then we dropped to jump to League One, and then from right back, I got a few goals there as well because we were we were a strong team at the time. Uh, we played a lot of attacking football, and you know, used to end up in the box quite a lot, and uh, got a few goals. Yeah. So was it like working under Gary Speed then? Very good. Yeah, he, is, he was. You know, probably the biggest influence in my career to have someone like that. Um, you know, telling me that you know I can be. I can do this. Uh, you can be, a, you know, you can be a top player if you keep your head down. You've got all the attributes, sort of thing, and staying after training, working with me uh, on different aspects of my game to improve it and stuff like that. And you know, it's just the, the time that he spent and the things that he said um, that were that were really good. It made it really easy to to work for him. And you know, you really wanted to repay the faith. So after that, then you got your move to Aston Villa in 2012. Quite a big step up because, like you say, Sheffield United at the time were in League One. Villa was still in the Premier League at that point. How, how did you find that step up? Uh, very tough. Um, obviously, like you say, it's a big step up. We're going from from League One, we just lost the playoff final. I uh, was devastated and got the phone call in the summer that I was going there. So, you know, that picked me up and we uh, went there in pre-season, all through pre-season, the games and things like that. The manager was 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 brilliant with me. Uh, made it very easy to settle in. Made it quite clear what he wanted from me and um, things like that. So, you know, I really enjoyed it. But like you say, the, the step up was, you know, the the, the, the speed. Of the, the the game is probably the biggest thing. Um, the the amount you get punished for mistakes as well uh, was a massive thing as well. Um, you know you can't be giving the ball away in certain areas because they're going to punish you with the, with the quality of players um, that's in the Premier League. So you know you have to quickly get used to where to play, when to play, things like that, and and the uh, the physical as well. I had to get I had to get a bit leaner, get a bit faster, try and get a bit stronger as well because the whole the whole physicality just goes up tenfold uh, in the Premiership. Yeah, so obviously Villa are quite a big club, former European winners. Did you feel a little more pressure there at, at, at a club like Villa to, to win games and do well? Yeah, there was definitely a lot of pressure. Um, I sensed that from the to the games straight away. And like I say, it's a, it's a massive uh, club, uh, got a lot of history. And um, the, the, the the couple of years before I went there, maybe you know maybe three or four or five years, they've been finishing top half, uh, pushing for Europe as well. So there was a lot of uh, expectancy on to, for us to win games. And you know, if it wasn't um, it was it was a tough place to be. Uh, in all honesty, you know the fans, as any as any anyone are, you know they're passionate. And if they're not winning, uh, you know they voice their concerns, and you know it, it got a bit tough for us at times. But um, thoroughly enjoyed um, every minute of it. Talk us through that goal you scored at Stoke, then, because that was an absolute <laughs> cracker, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't bad. Yeah, um, I just uh, I remember just before that actually, I'd, I'd slipped. Um, I think it was Johnny Walters actually cut inside me. Played it into kites and scored, so I was like, oh, "That's pretty much, you know, gutted that I thought it was, you know, thought of my fault." Yeah. Um, yeah. And then we get a breakaway, get a corner, um, it gets cleared, um, and then I've just tried to concentrate on my first touch really. And as I as I bought it down, I've seen a couple of players running towards me, so I've just thought, you know, it's all or nothing sort of thing. I, if I if I've just got to hit it, um, try and you know get the connection right, concentrate on the ball and hit it, and hopefully it goes in. And you know. It's, Within a split second, I thought, it's, you know, it's either that or they take it off me. So I just concentrate on the little ball and, and um, you know, luckily it flew in the top corner. Yeah, we're a cracking goal. That I'm looking forward to seeing you score uh, one similar in Burnley colours. But you, you know what? I was talking to, to Simon, obviously, early today. And um, I totally forgot about the goal that you got. Um, we're at MK Dons away, where weren't it? MK Dons away that you scored. Um, as the ball comes to you, I can't remember. But it comes at you with quite a bit of pace, doesn't it? Obviously, this is when you're playing for Burnley now. It comes at you with quite some pace and it's a decent finish, that. Yeah, so, yeah, it was good. Yeah, uh, it was Boyd, I think, who cut it back. Um, similar sort of thing, like you say, the, the pace was already on the ball, so I just, I just had to concentrate on on getting a connection. And um, you know, he came off and foot quite nice and went in the back of the net. Yeah, it's the only one I've scored. Hopefully, I can get a few more. Yeah, is that something you'd like to add to your game, or is it obviously being a right back not something that you focus on? It's not. No, it's not you know, something you focus on. But it's, it's nice to you know to chip in and um, to get a few goals. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's probably the best feeling in football is, is scoring. Um, so um, it'd be nice to you know to get back that, that feeling again. Yeah, talk to me about how the move to Burnley came about then. 
Um, well, I was, I was obviously I was at Villa. Um, it was coming towards the end of the season, and Tim Sherwood was the manager at the time, and he came up to me and he said, um, "I've got no problems with you, um, sort of thing. You're a great lad, uh, blah de blah, but I can't guarantee that you're going to play next season. So for your career, um, if you want to, if you want to move, sort of thing, we're not going to stand in your way." Um, so you know, like I said, not to play very many games, and that's all any footballer wants to do. So straight on the phone to my agent and said, you know, basically we can leave if if we want to. I uh, still had two years left of my contract there; could have easily just sat it out, sort of thing. And you know, but I, that's not me. I wanted to play football, so um, we had a few phone calls here and there. And I think at, I think at the time as well there was a, there was a swap deal mentioned for for trips oh, um, nice. at, at Villa as well. Uh, obviously, he went on to to, to Tottenham. So that didn't kind of materialise, but then we sort of knew that Burnley were interested, and it went from there. Really, it wasn't. It didn't really take too long. Um, the manager, the manager, sorry, um, rang me, um, spoke to me, said he wants me to come and play. Um, obviously, he explained to me that Trips is leaving, so there's a, there's a space there. I'll come in, I'll play straight away, sort of thing, and get back to what I want to do. So um, pretty much a no-brainer, really. Um, like I said, it didn't take very long. So it was all sorted. Yeah, so your first season at Burnley was also the championship winning season then. Um, but you had to start it at right back. I think it was behind Derek at first, wasn't it? What was that like? Was it just a, a case of, of waiting your time, or, or did you or were you always confident enough of breaking into the team? Well, yeah, it was it was in pre season. Um, I got injured. I did. Uh, I got uh, shin splints in pre season. Um, so they went out and they, they signed Tendai because I was going to be out for a while. Um, so then it was like you say, it was just patience. Then after that, ten played really well. We were doing we were doing well in the league. So it was just it was just patience and waiting to get my chance. And then, you know, when I did, uh, stay in there as long as I could. And you know, thankfully I did for the, for, uh, the rest of the season. So what was that experience like of winning the the title then with Burnley in your first season for, uh, from a player's perspective? Yeah, it's, it's still one of the best feelings I've ever had. Um, just the whole the whole season uh, was was brilliant. Yeah. You know, we're winning we're winning a lot of games, which is the best feeling as well. So. The lads were brilliant. Everyone was on a high. The fans on a high. You know, the staff, the feeling around the place was was it was brilliant. And you know, when we finally did it against QPR, it was just um, it's just like I say, one of the best feelings you know I've ever had. And you can't really put it into words how it is. It's just you know a group of uh, of lads coming together and and you know with one common goal and you know and succeeding in it. It's just it's a mixture of. You know, you just sat there thinking, "Wow, we've done it," and then you just the other half is absolutely uh, buzzing. Um, you want to go and celebrate with all the lads. Yeah, I can imagine. But what made, what do you think made us so good that season then? Because obviously we went twenty three games undefeated from Boxing Day. We were just relentless, especially in the second half of the season. What were it that made us click so well? Um, pretty much that word that you just said. I think relentless. Uh, that was mm. us. We weren't always uh, the best team in in games, uh, but we we know how to stay in games as long as we can. Um, and we we knew how to, to score goals. Drea that season was you know was, was phenomenal for us. Uh, big Boxy up there as well, and we had Joey in the middle. Um, it was a big voice for us, a big presence. Um, everyone in on it together, and it was just sticking it out, working hard, um, making sure that you know there was no stone left unturned. Everyone was fit, aligned, and we just like I said, we were relentless the whole season, um, and just just kept going. And as that run goes on and gets higher, I think it puts fear into other teams as well you know these have not lost for 12 13 14 games sort of thing and we just steamrolled and just picked up momentum and you know towards the end i thought um I th- you know a few games to go we, we've got a real chance here obviously middlesbrough and brighton were, were chasing us and didn't seem to, to lose either but yeah. um, we had it worked out obviously them two had to play each other so if, if we just keep picking up points and winning and um, that will that will do it and you know in the end we did so what changed on Boxing Day that season then? Because obviously we, we lost 3-0, I think it was at Hull City, weren't it? And then after that, the run started. What, what, what was it? Was it a conversation or, or like a change of mentality, a change of change of style? I think, I think I can't remember. We had definitely had a meeting. Um, I can't remember what was said, but it was pretty much realigning everything that we're, that we're about. Obviously, I'd only been there six months, so I wasn't sure, but a lot of lads have been there a couple of years. And you could tell from the way the manager was talking that um, he wanted to get back to being what Burnley is, um, being hard to beat. You know, fighting, running, uh, on and off the ball, and you know we did. He made a couple of tactical changes. He uh, put Ben in, Ben back into you know into centre half, but Wardy at left back, and I don't know. It just it just um, just went from there really. Like you say, we pick up a couple of results, then the confidence grows, and and the more times you're winning games and going unbeaten, it just it just picks up. And I think just from that moment on, you know, the meeting, the lads realigning and saying, listen, yeah, we we want to kick on, and, and we did. 
There's been four years in the Premier League since then as well, though. Obviously, probably the pinnacle of that is finishing seventh. Again, what made us so good that season? Um, similar sort of stuff to what did then, I think, um, but on a, on, a, on a higher level with being hard to beat, sticking together, um, knowing our shape, knowing our jobs, things like that, and then the quality as well that we, uh, that we showed. Um, that we scored some great goals that season, played some really good football that I don't think we've got enough credit for. Um, but it's basically just you know a, a group of lads and the staff, obviously, that put, in, put together a great team um, great ethos, you know, no egos, no one's got their own agendas, things like that. Everyone's in line. Everyone knows it's the, it's the team that's the most important. And I think that mentality and that, that group mentality is, is what uh, st- stood us in good stead. And you know, finishing seventh, I think it's I think it got still got overlooked a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, for a team like us, um, we finishing seventh is pretty much as they say the best of the rest. Um, I still think it's a phenomenal feat, and you know, like I said, I think. Aside from winning the championship, which feels probably a little bit better, I think you know finishing seventh is, is probably the biggest achievement in my career. Yeah, is it a frustration as a as a Burnley player that Burnley don't get the credit? Because it certainly is as a fan, and it's been something that stuck around with us pretty much ever since I can remember. And we still it's still now like say like you say that we finished seventh. No one really spoke about it. The season after Wolves finished seventh, I think it was, and everyone were crowing about it and, and our yeah. amazing football. It, it must be frustrating. It is, yeah. It's, as you actually, you know, I think. Quite, find it quite funny on the side of it, um, just how people just dismiss it, like you say. Um, another club does it, and then it's you know it's it's, it's this big um, achievement. But uh, with as I've been at Burnley now, um, you, like you say, you kind of realise that people don't talk about it as much and, and things like that. And it, it's just um, you know it is very frustrating, you know, kind of annoying to be honest. But you know we know within our within our community and within within the team, and, and the gaffer always mentions it. We know that. Uh, how big an achievement it is um, and things like that so we do what we need to do sort of thing and you know stick together the fans team the management staff um, you know we'll we'll keep pushing on obviously the season after qualification for the actual Europa League didn't get out of the qualification games losing against Olympiacos were were you disappointed with how that that happened? I was very disappointed with how the Olympiacos happened yeah Um, I've never seen a, a game of two hours like it to be honest um, without trying to get myself in too much trouble, the from the referee's performance in the first half to the second was was outrageous. Um, we saw some things in the tunnel at half time. You know, with a lot of their representatives um, forcefully putting their point across, shall we say? Um, but you know, I'm not trying to say that that's what happened. But you know, it, it was really frustrating how we played really well, got a lot of uh, decisions, got uh, things going in our, our favour, sort of thing. To the second half, getting absolutely nothing. Yeah, um, yeah. literally just dead set against us um, so I was frustrated at that how that actually happened you know even though Olympiacos is a big, big club and played European football a lot and it was just the way that it happened that um, it frustrated a lot of us um, you know to kind of fall at the last hurdle to get into the group stage was a bit, bit um, upsetting but like I said to have achieved it and to have played uh, in Europe was, was great for us all season, of, season after obviously a bit of a slow start was Europe to blame for that do you think? Um, I think it was. Uh, I think we tried to say it wasn't at the time, um, but I think looking back, you know, the lads were um, finding it tough travelling and, and things like that, getting back early hours of the morning and not having uh, the usual time that we had to prepare for games and things like that. But we tried to put it to the back of our minds because we didn't want to use it as excuses. Um, but I think it did take its toll, um, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but you know, we, we we probably had another meeting that season. Um, stuck together again and, and picked it back up. Yeah, was there ever a point in that season where you, well, you or all, all the rest of the players ever thought that we might not actually be getting out of the relegation trouble or were you always confident that we had the quality to do it? Yeah, uh, we were always confident of doing it. You know, you have to be really. Um, we'd done it a couple of seasons. Like you say, we'd, we'd, when we first went up, we'd done it and then we finished seventh the season before so we knew we had the quality in the, in the dressing room and the, and the mentality to do it so it was just, again, getting back to what we are, what, we, what we're known for, what we're good at. Um, and as soon as we find that, you know, we seem to click, um, and then we kick on again, sort of thing. I think we, we've done it this season as well. You know, picking up a win against Leicester, then the, the draw at Old Trafford, draw at Arsenal, and it, and, it's, and it kicks on again. Yeah, obviously before lockdown, we'd have gone quite a few games unbeaten. We'd turn the season round, like you say, with that Leicester game. I think really, probably with the penalty save from Pope. I think that moment turned that game around, and then that game's turned the season around, in my opinion. Um, but before lockdown, were there any more talk of like Europe from the players? Yeah, we were looking for looking forward to um, again 
uh, we like you said, we put ourselves in a good position. Uh, picked up a couple of wins. And got right up to the, you know the top half of the table again, and and we were saying uh, for it in with it uh, in the house. Why not? You know, let's push on again. There's no point in settling for you know for mediocre. We'll, you know, the manager's not about that at all. He wants to to strive for success all the time and keep pushing and keep pushing and and you know the, the lads are just the same. That's what's um, done us you know so well over the last couple of years since I've been here. So you know we'll carry on and hopefully if we do get back to playing that we can you know, hit the ground running and, and and make a push for it. Talk us through that win at Man United then, because from a fan's perspective, that that was special. Yeah, it's, it's one of the best nights I've had as a player as well. So I can imagine, you know, for the fans that it was. Um, we, uh, we we rode our luck in the first half. I think they had a few chances. Uh, the matter chance, uh, chance, sorry, Martial's had one as well, where Chaz has made a last-ditch tackle sort of thing. But I think when you go to those places, you need to you need to have your fair share of luck to come away with anything. So, uh, <laughs> oh wait. <laughs> Where was I? Yeah, um, so we rode our luck a little bit, but as we do, we stick in games. Um, and then, you know, Woody gives us a, a foothold, um, puts us one in the luck. You can hear from the, the celebration that I was a bit a bit happy at that time. Yeah, 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 yeah. I do remember that. <laughs> so but then, you know, you go in one nil at half time at Old Trafford and the lads, the lads are buzzing. Uh, and then the gaffer gives us a rollicking, saying that we've been, you know, we've been, we've been off it, uh, sort of thing. No one's made any contact with anyone. We're showing them too much respect, sort of thing. So, you know, that was a bit of a. A bit of a kick in the backside. He wanted to look at Old Trafford, but the manager he wasn't he wasn't settling for that. Um, he wanted to make sure that we were right on it because they've got the quality to to get back into the game, obviously. Um, and then J Rod smacks one from you know the edge of the box and it goes in and you know it's all of a sudden like this is you know this could happen here. This we could beat Man United at Old Trafford, you know, which, which doesn't happen to a lot of players. So uh, we were delighted. It was it was strange really because I thought after we went to another, I don't think they, well, apart from they did score a uh, foul on Jeff, I don't think they really had any chances. No. Felt, I actually felt quite comfortable. Um, you know, we had them playing in front of us pretty much. Really, yeah, they kept going side to side. So uh, it was it was it was a good night. You know, and when the whistle went, uh, you could you know looked over the fans and you could see how much it meant to everyone. Yeah, but was the season before not in the back of your mind? Because obviously we were two 0 up at Old Trafford the season before, and, and unfortunately drew two two. But surely that must have been it back of your mind. Um, it did actually. I did actually remember thinking that when I was running back after J Rod scored, and he went two and I was like, "We've done this before." Uh, I remember saying it to a couple of lads, like not in as many words, but come on, like, you know, this is this is not done, sort of thing. Let's let's make sure we're on it next five ten, keep it tight, and then we'll then we'll kick on from there. And but I did I did have a little think about it. Yeah, well, you know, luckily um, we we stuck it, we stuck it out, and it didn't happen again. Yes. To, to, what is it like to work under Sean Dyche then? Because it does seem like the out, from the outside looking in, he's quite disciplined and you just give a perfect example there then. like it, it, it didn't let you at half-time against Man United get carried away. He gave you a bit of a rollicking, as you say. So well, what's it like to work under under him? It's, 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 it's good. It's very good. Um, yeah, definitely you know, the best thing that's happened to my game uh, is playing under Sean um, because he, he works a lot um, on shape and um, you know uh, the tactics of where to be, when to be, and things like that. And you just know that uh, the, the group that is assembled, the lads, uh, they're there for each other. You know, you don't feel isolated. You know, when you're going out defending 1v1, you, you sort of think, you know, if, if, if he does happen to get past me, talk, he's there, or, you know, I was playing, sorry, or, you know, if, if someone does a 1-2, the winger's tracking his man sort of thing. So it's he makes things like that a lot easy. He, he makes the game very simple. Uh, he doesn't ask for, you know, for too much. He doesn't do too much um, football work sort of, you know, like slowing it down, saying I want this, this, and this. He just he sets the um, the formation, the tactics, uh, what you want to do, and just and then when it comes to the weekend, he gives you the freedom uh, to go out and play. As long as the basics are done uh, done well, um, everyone's working from the shape, working hard, running hard on and off the ball, making contact with with the opposition, you know, tackling things like that. Um, it's, it's very simple, very easy for him to work for, um, very enjoyable as well. He's you know, he's a nice, very very approachable, a very approachable man. If you've got a problem, or you know, yeah, I don't know, a yeah. family, a family event, or anything like that. Uh, very, very approachable, very understanding, and he's very family orientated himself. So, um, you know, he's, he's he's great. It's a perfect match for me. Talk me through the current sort of like dynamic with that right back position, because from the outside looking in, it tends to be that like Sean will will have like not necessarily his favourites, but his preferred people in certain positions. But with right back, it tends to be a little bit 50-50 between you and Phil Barsley. Is it a different, obviously, because you're very different players, will he play you in a certain type of games and play Phil in another type of game? Um, no, I don't think he picks his games, no. I just think um, if one of us is not playing well, then we come out. That's the other one's uh, ready to go straight in. 
Um, I remember him when he pulled me out at uh, the start of this, this season and said that um, he thought I'd had a bit of a drop in form sort of thing. Um, but he knows that I've got the character to you know, to kick on and, and give that as a bit of a kick up my arse. So, you know, like Bardo, she's played Premier League football for a long time, so he's more than capable of, of coming in and, you know, and holding his own. So um, it's up to me then to work hard in training. And uh, that, that sort of rivalry, well, not rivalry, what's the word I'm looking for? Competition, sorry, is is what, you know, what you need at a Premier League club because it, it keeps people on their toes. Um, like I said, the gaffer said I'd had a drop in form and, you know, it wasn't, oh, let's give him three, four, five games because we've got nothing else sort of thing. It was, um, you know, Bardo's waiting uh, chomping at the bit to play so your form's drop sort of thing so Bardo's going in and that's just that's just how it is I think everywhere really if, you, if you're not playing up to up to standard there's people ready to play Yeah fair enough um, a, a lot's always made about Burnley's squad being quite tight like close and stuff like that but obviously at the start of the season we had a few big departures obviously Heaton left Voxy left and Stephen DeFore as well obviously Heaton and, and Voxy have been here for a long long time but what's it like in a, in a dressing room when, when two big players especially when one of them's the captain leaves yeah. for another club especially a rival club yeah, well that was hard to take actually you know since I've been here I think it's five years now um, Heats has been you know he's been different class obviously the captain made it made me very welcome things like that and he's a top top man um, got on really well with, with with him and his family as well. So it was it was it was hard to you know to see him go after after knowing him for so long. And Boxy is, is the same. Uh, got really close with Boxy. Um, he was a, he was a, again a top guy, which which pretty much everyone is in the squad. Um, to the gaffer, that's up, down, you know down to the gaffer and the recruitment to to get these sort of players in. But you know even even people like Wardy as well. I roomed with him my first season um, when I came. Um, different class again. So. It is hard, like you say, when the um, players that have been there a long time um, are leaving. But, you know, that's part and parcel of the game, really. Uh, we're still in touch now. We still talk a lot. Um, so, you know, it's obviously it's for their own careers that they, they chose to, to do what they wanted to do. So, you know, um, we wished each other all the best and, and that was it. Yeah, so finally from me, because I know you've got, like I said, there's a few, few kids coming in and out. I think I can hear my child stirring as well now. And I presume you probably want to get on Fortnite in a bit as well. I know I want to try and get on COD soon at some point. Um, but I think you, your contract runs out at the end of, not this season, but next season, 2021. So what's what's sort of like next for you? Have you got any plans? Do you want, Would you rather stay at Burnley? Would, would you, you know, have you got any plans of, of what you want to do next? No, um, I'm sort of a cross the bridge when we get to it sort of thing, uh, sort of person. Sorry, um, I tend not to think too much about it because then it you know it eats away at you um, and can affect your performance and things like that. Obviously, it, need, it needs sorting and we need to plan. Don't get me wrong, but yeah, you know, um, hopefully, I don't know, the, I don't know what the manager's thinking, obviously, and things like that. But I, I want to stay up early for as long as I can. I've got no reasons to leave at all. I love the place. I love the fans. I love living where I live. The family love it. The kids love the school. So everything's absolutely perfect. Um, so I've got no reason to want to leave at all. Um, but obviously, like I say, it's down to the manager and, and the chairman and things like that. So, you know, you, like I say, cross that bridge when you come to it. Um, perfect scenario for me is, is a new contract at, at Burnley. Happy days and fingers crossed I you get that because I'm sure a lot of fans would agree with that as well. But like I said earlier, mate, I'll, I'll reiterate it now. Thanks very much for doing this. I really, really appreciate it. I know you don't have to. So honestly, it means a lot. Thank you very much for doing it for me, buddy. Thanks for having me. Right, so there we go. Big thank you to, to Matthew for coming on the show. Um, really, really appreciate it. I, th- I think I'm on nickname terms now, to be fair. So big shout out to Louts, I think I can say now. Oh, Louts. Yeah, he's one of my boys, I think, now. So big shout out to Louts for coming on the show. Like we just said earlier he, he didn't need to do it and you know and, and he spoke he spoke about quite a lot as well he spoke quite openly on there and I know you haven't actually listened to it yet because we've just filmed in the intro and the outro so I'll just give you a stat there um, that I don't think you were aware of until I spoke to you on the phone about it yesterday but his first professional goal was against Burnley I did not know that until I did my research no, I didn't know that. yesterday shitbag <laughs> <laughs> yeah and also I, I remember when me and you were chatting before and we were discussing sort of things that you know I can talk about and that sort of stuff. Not not obviously that he were putting in place, just sort of like what me and you were discussing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember you saying like, oh, I don't remember him ever scoring for Burnley. He's never scored for Burnley, which is a shame. But he did. He scored in the Championship winning season, and I I had forgotten about it if I were being honest with you. Um, but he scored a goal. I think it was the fourth goal in a five 0 win at MK Dons. Oh, was that that? Do you know what? I only interestingly know that was that Joey Barton's first. Goal yeah. for Burnley yeah. because of the uh, the quiz night that you you hosted last week. Yeah, which... yeah. So if if you if if you are a fan of the podcast, because we do get you know a few hundred listens now every week, uh, we we have started doing um, 
a quiz live on Facebook every week. If anyone wants to join, everyone's more than welcome, more the merrier. We're doing it again this week, 7 p.m., Sunday, May the 10th. So if you have got a bit of spare time, um, please come. You might find out some more stuff about Burnley Football Club that you didn't know. Like, we didn't know that that was Joey Barton's. I think I got that question right, to be fair, but a lot of people thought that um, his first goal were against Brentford, uh, but no, his first goal were against MK Dons that are in that game. So... Well, I yeah, so I didn't know. Mouts and Bart's both scored enough. their first Burnley goals in the same game. Well, I didn't know that, but uh, he's some guy, isn't he? He's a, he's a, honestly, he's a top, top guy. I've got so much time for him out of the podcast world, in the hairdressing world that I deal with him mainly. But like, he's always the sort of like first to, to offer a hand if I ever need anything. And it, it's never anything sort of, it's always really, what's the word? What's the journalistic way of saying things that aren't really that important? But He's always like the one that will go out of his way, basically, to try yeah. and help me, whether it be a ticket for a match or just moving a, an appointment time. He seems to be the easiest one of uh, that sort of helps me with everything that I do, really. He's, he's a top, top guy and, and his family as well. I, I deal with his family a lot and I don't know. I'm in there every week and I don't feel like an alien or a third party in the house, let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. He was more than welcoming yesterday. He's all of a sudden go around to his house and we did it on Sky, but he was more than accommodating and stuff and... You know, if, if I needed to quickly do something in the front room, which I did from a little boy at one point, he, did, he didn't mind. He was just like, yeah, fine. So, yeah, I totally second that. Um, but let us know how you thought the interview went. Let us know your thoughts on the podcast this week. It's Obviously, I'm always keen to hear your feedback, especially when we do big interviews like that. Um, so anything that you, you thought we could have done differently or could have done better, please let us know. And if you just enjoyed it, again, just let us know because, obviously, it's always good to get some positive feedback. If you don't already, please follow us on all the social media channels. Just search Turfcast Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. And we'll see you next week for maybe a proper podcast or maybe another In Conversation with Who Knows. We might be having some conversations about In Conversations with. We don't know that yet. Or what we we do know, but we can't tell you that just yet. But stay tuned and we'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you.